lecture uh, today. It's really my pleasure to welcome Jan. Uh, and before I'll hand the word over to him, I'll say a few words about his, bio his biography. Jan Lecun is Vice President and Chief AI Scientist at Facebook and Silver Professor at NYU, affiliated with the Grant Institute of Mathematical Sciences and the Center for Data Science. He was the founding director of Facebook AI Research and of the NYU Center for Data Science. He received an engineering diploma from École Supérieure for Electronic Engineering in Paris and a PhD from Sorbonne Université. After a postdoc in Toronto, he joined AT&T Bell Labs in 1988 and AT&T Labs in 1996 as head of image processing research. He joined NYU as a professor in 2003 and Facebook in 2013. His interests include AI, machine learning, computer perception, robotics, and computational neuroscience. He is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the recipient of the 2018 ACM Turing Award, together with Jeffrey Hinton and Joshua Bengio, for conceptual and engineering breakthroughs that have made deep neural networks a critical component of computing. Today, Jan will speak about the deep learning applied math connection, and I very much look forward to your talk, Jan. But before I hand over to you, um, let me just remind everyone that you can submit your questions in the chat or the Q&A box throughout the talk, and questions will then be handled at the end by Gitta. So with that, I hand over to you, Jan. Very much look forward uh, to Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, thank you to uh, Joel and the organizers for, uh, for inviting me. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that I can do this in real time. I prefer this to having to record a talk uh, in advance. OK, so um, I'm going to talk about deep learning, obviously. And um, uh, I've been trying for many years to try to sort of connect the applied math community to this, to this problem. And it didn't happen until deep learning sort of became very prominent. Uh, but now it's really happened. Uh, okay, so uh, as you're probably all aware, the the main uh, workhorse of machine learning and deep learning at the moment, and AI really, is supervised learning, where you train a machine with examples in, and you feed the machine with the correct answer. And uh, machine learning consists essentially uh, of minimizing an energy function that, or loss function, an objective function, I should say, that uh, averaged over the, the training samples minimizes the error measure in, measured in some way between the output you want and the output you get. And this works amazingly well for speech recognition, for image recognition, for uh, even translation and things of that type. Uh, but it requires a lot of samples. And uh, it, you know, it seems that humans and animals are able to learn with considerably fewer samples. So people have, have worked on things like transfer learning and things like this. But, um, but none of those solutions really kind of approach the efficiency that we see in humans and animals. Um, so, uh, um, as you probably all know, um, um, supervised learning, but also all other forms of, uh, of learning, uh, generally use uh, a form of gradient descent um, called stochastic gradient descent, which consists in basically having a very noisy estimate of the objective function and its gradient based on either a single sample or a small number of samples and not averaging over. So that rules out a lot of uh, sophisticated optimization methods that people are in, in, in this community, in the applied math community, I've worked on for many decades. Um, and, and the properties, the convergence property of stochastic gradient, of course, have been studied extensively in the context of adaptive filters, but also in the context of uh, uh, sort of large scale machine learning. Um, so, this is now the workhorse, stochastic gradient descent. Nobody even uh, considers anything else. Uh, but they do consider refinements of it where uh, you try to exploit the the, the structure of the objective function to, to find the minimum. Now, uh, deep learning in this business is the idea of essentially building, or at least a simple form of deep learning, is the idea of building a learning system by stacking uh, multiple layers of parameterized nonlinear functions, essentially functional modules. And uh, it's easy to compute the gradient of the objective with respect to all the parameters in a chain like this by basically applying chain rule, as I'm sure you're all aware of. This is what uh, in neural net and machine learning people call uh, backpropagation. Um, 
So a classical neural net is really a, a, a sequence of alternated uh, linear and nonlinear operation. The linear operation is just a matrix multiplication, essentially, or perhaps a sparse matrix. And then the nonlinear operation is a pointwise nonlinearity, very often one of those what people call ReLU, which is really a half-wave rectifier. So it's the identity when the argument is positive and equal to zero when the argument is negative. And by stacking linear and nonlinear operations of, th of this type multiple times, uh, you get a, a fairly powerful parameterization of a lot of, uh, you know, a family of a lot of useful functions. So there are theorems that show that with only two layers, you can approximate any function you want as close as you want. And so the a question the theorists might ask is, why would you need multiple layers? And it took a very long time for some of us to convince the community that actually, indeed, multiple layers were useful. Um, uh, the reason being that the, the world is essentially compositional. So a lot of the data that we're trying to process with this, uh, be it images or other sound or other natural signals, tend to be compositional. They have a lot of local correlations. And so if you have a composition, compositional signal, there is an advantage in sort of processing, processing it hierarchically by sort of progressively extracting more and more abstract representations of that signal. So that's the kind of the, the sort of you know, conceptual philosophical necessity for layers. Uh, there's a more immediate one, which is that uh, the family of functions that seem to be interesting for us to learn seems to be more efficiently represented by multiple layers and by just two layers. Even though you can represent them with two layers, most functions require a ridiculously large number of nonlinearities in the middle layer. And so it's really impractical for things like, say, image or speech recognition. You really need multiple layers. Um, and what I've been puzzled by is why it took so long for people to uh, really sort of come to terms with this. Uh, so one reason is that um, uh, people in sort of uh, machine learning and optimization uh, were really sort of upset by the fact that when you stack multiple layers, the objective function now becomes non-convex. And of course, there is no proof of convergence where you have non-convex objective function. So a lot of people objected to the fact that you don't know what you're doing uh, if you're optimizing a non-convex function. Now, experimentally, it's been known for four decades that uh, there is essentially no problem of being stuck in local minima in, uh, in, in, in multi-layer neural nets, as long as they are uh, bigger than necessary for the problem at hand. So if you make the network much bigger than necessary, um, you know, in, in the end, the function may require way fewer elements than uh, you put in your network. But if the network is much bigger than necessary, then the optimization problem becomes relatively easy, and your system never gets stuck into a local minimum, because the or very rarely, because the uh, the space of, of, of solutions is actually a big chunk of the overall ambient space of parameters. And it's very easy to find a local minimum. The, 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 the minima are, are very degenerate. Um, and so it, so it becomes easier to find it. Now, when you tell this now to statisticians, they tell you, oh, but that, that's an abomination because now you're using an enormous model with lots of parameters. And you have absolutely no, uh, uh, you know, no evidence that your system will uh, work outside of sample, we generalize because it's so over-parameterized. And there, something else happened, which is a bit of a theoretical mystery and seems a bit of a bit like magic, which is that those systems, uh, despite being widely over-parameterized, seem to uh, uh, sorry seem to to generalize regardless. And so you may have uh, neural nets with you know, hundreds of millions, billions, even hundreds of billions of parameters, and they end up generalizing, you know, fine with, you know, uh, way fewer training samples than they have parameters. So that's a bit of a mystery. I think there's a lot of very interesting work, uh, a theoretical work that sort of tries to explain this phenomenon in terms of some sort of implicit regularization. So it seems that uh, when you stack linear layers, ignoring the nonlinearities for a moment, uh, you seem to get sort of a natural uh, re reduction of the rank of the, the activations in the intermediate layers. Uh, there's an initial paper by um, uh, Nadav Cohen and Sanjeev Arora about this, and sort of a follow-up paper by, by Nadav, uh, kind of showing that uh, there's some sort of automatic rank reduction that might explain some sort of uh, uh, implicit regularization that occurs naturally as a consequence of gradient descent learning. Uh, there's other papers that sort of get pretty much the same result in sort of different ways. Um, so that's a bit of a theoretical mystery, but uh, which I think you know there's a lot um, uh, 
to bring to the table here from the applied math community as well as from the statistical physics community, which in the 90s was very interested in this problem and sort of dropped that, but now they're coming back to it. Uh, so I, th I think it's a fascinating uh, set of developments. Um, so backpropagation is just a practical application of a chain rule uh, for you know multivariate uh, functions essentially, and it says you know if you want to compute the the gradient of uh, some objective function with respect to some variables, you just multiply the Jacobians of all of those boxes with respect to their inputs and parameters going backwards uh, in the flow of of, of computation. Now uh, this concept is surprisingly powerful. Uh, uh, I'm sure a lot of you are, have used automatic differentiations in the past, and this is basically just like automatic differentiation. Um, and in fact, uh, the root of that algorithm can be traced back to classical work in optimal control in the 50s and 60s, where you know people use you know the kelly bryson algorithm or the Pontryagin uh, extremum principle, which basically you know for optimal control uh, treats this problem of kind of a stack of uh, a function of modules that you have to compute gradients over. This is called the adjoint state model um, in optimal control. Uh, so the idea is very old. Of course, you know, a chain rule even in multi-dimension is very old. Uh, but the realization that you can use this to train the system through gradient descent uh, actually did not really pop up until the 1980s. Um, so that said, people have sort of generalized this concept. The, the type of architectures that people use nowadays are not just chains of linear and of alternative linear and nonlinear uh, pointwise nonlinearities. It's more, there are more programs now. So the, the, the type of deep learning systems, uh, the, the modern ones, are basically, uh, you could, it consists in writing uh, a program, a, a function, uh, using a, a framework like PyTorch or, or TensorFlow, uh, let's say PyTorch, and what the system gives you for free is the ability to compute the gradient of the output of that function with respect to sort of pretty much anything that goes on inside. And so this is a very, very powerful concept, which is sort of a generalization of automatic differentiation, if you want. And it's very flexible, and you know, it runs on GPUs in parallel and all that stuff, so because this has been a huge demand for this. And so you, you can basically write your model, uh, you know, writing it as basically a Python program, uh, and automatically, you get to differentiate this with respect to any variable you want. And so uh, that can be used for machine learning, can be used for optimal control, it can be used for numerical analysis. Um, it's becoming a tool that a lot of communities now are using because of su such interest uh, in, uh, in deep learning. Uh, so that has come to be known as differentiable programming. Um, you can think of this more than just deep learning. It's you know uh, programming in such a way that there is uh, uh, support for automatic differentiation in your programming language. Uh, okay, so of course, uh, very often you have to put some structure into the architecture of the network for it to process certain types of data appropriately. And there is the idea of convolutional net that my name is attached to, uh, which uh, basically replaces the, the full matrix of the linear operations by uh, convolutions, uh, which are another type of linear operators with fewer parameters. Um, so basically, each layer is a, is a filter bank, essentially. And then you have pointwise nonlinearity, and then there's another kind of operation called pooling, which basically is uh, subsampling uh, with some aggregation rule, which could be an average or an LP norm or a max. Uh, it's properly, properly in, it's, it, most of the time now it's called a max. Uh, the uh, root of the idea of this goes back to uh, classic work in neuroscience uh, by Huber and Wiesel from you know, this Nobel Prize winning on the architecture of the visual cortex. And this really, there really was inspiration from neuroscience. Uh, even though you can sort of post hoc justify mathematically the reason for why this should should be done this way. Um, so comnets have been incredibly successful for a lot of applications. Uh, you know, every single um, uh, automated vision systems for for uh, for cars today. You know, that that keeps in lane and detects uh, pedestrians and brakes automatically is based is based on convolutional nets. Most speech recognition systems are based on convolutional nets. Uh, most new medical image analysis systems and image restoration systems are based on convolutional nets. So there is a uh, you know a huge amount of applications for this that have uh, uh, been deployed over the last few years, and the results in computer vision are just amazing. Now, you know, but, you know, back in 2012, people could sort of barely, with the best systems, uh, you know, recognize the dominant object in an image uh, with you know far from, from, from perfect reliability. And now what we can do is basically train those neural nets to essentially label every pixel in an image with the uh, object that it belongs to, 
right? So all those pixels are labeled as a person. Uh, this one is a bicycle. Uh, the bottle uh, at the bottom here is detected. That's another person, another person, etc. The persons are included, but are still detected. Um, and the, this is the idea of, sort of panoptic segmentation, where not just objects, but also background areas are, are labeled like tree, sky, road, etc. Uh, and this works really well with you know hundreds of categories, sometimes thousands. Uh, simultaneously, you can do post estimation of, of bodies, and all of those basically use the same trunk, the same backbone for the neural net, with sort of different heads that uh, that that produce the, the different results. Um, uh, so Facebook has a system like this called Detectron, which is open source, and you can just download it and, and play with it. It's pre it's pre trained; you can train it if you want. Um, of course, it's been very successful in medical image analysis, and uh, I think the use of ComNet in medical ima image analysis. Is uh, is so promising that it's you know basically dominates a lot of uh, uh, current uh, uh, conferences on on medical imaging. Um, those networks use a, a very interesting architecture that is sometimes called UNet, which uh, includes a, a convolutional net that sort of represents images hierarchically by progressively reducing the spatial re re resolution and increasing the number of feature types. And then there is sort of a, a converse architecture, which you could call the deconvolutional net, that sort of regenerates an image of the same resolution as the input. Um, and this is uh, the kind of thing you want to use for uh, image segmentation at high resolution, and uh, like in, in the case of medical imaging, for example. Uh, these are pictures from a uh, collaboration between Facebook Air Research and NYU on kind of speeding up the data collection for MRI data, uh, where you know you can sort of restore the image with uh, a fourth of the data that would normally be necessary for the full resolution image. Uh, so a lot of applications of deep learning and, and convolutional nets that pop up every day, uh, but I think the ones that people will be more familiar with are, are, is for uh, autonomous driving or semi-autonomous driving or driving assistance and medical imaging. Uh, of course, it's already used a lot in uh, uh, you know, online services for uh, content filtering and, and, and things of that type. Uh, people tell me that, uh, according to some statistics, the automated emergency braking systems that are now mounted in every car in Europe uh, as a kind of a standard feature, it's kind of mandated by the government in some certain countries, reduce the number of collisions by 40%. And that's enormous, which means, you know, uh, deep learning and convolutional nets save lives. Same for medical imaging. Now, a very interesting development that some of you may, may be aware of is the fact that uh, you can define convolutions on graphs. So if your data does not, does not come to you in the form of a, a sort of regular array, 2D, 1D, 2D, 3D, 4D, um, if it comes to you in the form of a function on the graph, you can still define convolutions on graphs. So uh, the idea is uh, a convolution, of course, is a diagonal operator in Fourier space. So uh, if you can compute a Fourier transform of your signal, then in the Fourier space, you just do a pointwise multiplication with uh, the Fourier transform of a convolution kernel, and and then do the inverse transform, and you've you've done a convolution. Now you can define the Fourier transform in a uh, of a function on the graph, and that basically consists in transforming the function on the graph into the eigenspace of the graph Laplacian. Um, when I talk about this to computer scientists, I have to explain what all of this is. But in applied math, a lot of people know what this what this means. Um, and so you can define this on, on just about any network, but of course it's very expensive because there is no equivalent of FFT for irregular graphs. So there's a lot of work on what's called geometric deep learning or graph neural nets that consist in sort of finding efficient ways to uh, do the equivalent of, of convolutions uh, on uh, uh, functions on irregular graphs, essentially. Uh, sometimes even dynamic graphs, so graphs that, uh, you know, you have uh, regular graphs uh, in which you use standard convolutional nets, you have uh, irregular graphs with a fixed structure uh, in which you can use those spectral convolutional nets. And then you have irregular graph whose structure changes with any, any new piece of data. So for example, if you want to represent a molecule as a graph, uh, a new molecule will have a new graph. So your network uh, needs to be able to uh, uh, digest uh, graphs of varying structure. And that's uh, entirely possible to, to, uh, to define. Uh, uh, last year, a couple of years ago, uh, I co-organized a workshop at IPAM uh, on new deep learning techniques. And there's a, a number of talks on this topic. Um, if you really are interested in this, I recommend a series of talks by, uh, uh, recent talks by Xavier Bresson, who um, really has you know, given wonderful uh, lectures about this, uh, as well as a recent blog post by uh, uh, Michael Bronstein, 
from Imperial College, uh, which I think is on um, uh, uh, towards data science uh, uh, blog. Now, um, again, I think relevant to the applied math uh, uh, community is that people are starting to use convolutional nets as a way to compute efficiently approximate solutions of PDEs. So a PDE uh, uh, solver, you know, an integrator is is basically you know uh, the state of your uh, of your system at time t plus one is the state of uh, the system at time t plus. Uh, uh, you know the, the the time increment time sum function of uh, of the previous state, um, and uh, and you could think of the g function here as being a convolutional net. Very often the interactions are local in a PDE, and so you, you could think of this as uh, you know the g function as some sort of convolutional net. And the the question people are asking is, can I increase the size of the of the of the grid that I use to solve my PDE? And uh, both spatial and temporal, and get the same result not by actually solving a P the PDE, but uh, by training a neural net to basically predict the result of the integration for several time steps with a, a, a coarser grain. Uh, and this seems like a free lunch, but it works. And so people are using this for things like uh, lattice QCD in, in physics, for fluid dynamics, uh, predicting the you know hydrodynamical properties of solids, for example. Uh, and perhaps optimizing them through gradient descent. And for cosmology astro uh, astrophysics, there's a very interesting work uh, that I'll mention in a bit. Um, now, sometimes those, those grids are irregular. So we're back to this idea of using graph convolutional nets where you know, your, 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 your grid being irregular, you, you sort of have to deal with the irregularity of it. Um, so that's an example of a paper that appeared a, uh, a little while ago in PNAS. Uh, by a group from the, uh, uh, the the Flatiron Institute in New York, and they're interested in sort of simulating the early moments of the universe uh, at the scale of the universe, and it's essentially impractical. So what they do is they train a convolutional net on the subdomain by just running the um, you know the equation that that they know how to solve, but on a relatively small domain that generates training samples, and with the, this result they train a convolutional net, uh, which is actually one of those unit architectures that was used for image. Uh, Segmentation. They train one of those neural nets to predict the result of the integration for several time steps, and only using information from coarser uh, uh, grain. Uh, and once they have the system, it's pretty efficient to run. So now they can run a simulation at the full scale of, of the entire universe and get some results that seem qualitatively interesting. There's a lot of really interesting work in this, which uh, I think is I find really fascinating. Um, so this is sort of you know learning to integrate. Um, and uh, so this is the use of graph neural nets for analyzing uh, uh, um, high energy physics uh, experiments. Uh, OK, OK, so now a big puzzle. OK, we're still far with our learning methods from reproducing the type of learning that we observe in animals and humans. Uh, and, and, and the question is, how is it that humans and animals learn so quickly? And I think it's, it's really a very, very important question, because uh, we need to be able to get machines to learn to, let's say, drive a car without uh, running in simulations for millions of hours. Uh, we need to be to have machines that are really robust uh, for do, performing computer vision or natural language understanding. We need machines to have some level of common sense to know how the world works, basically learning by observation. And that's the trick. The humans and animals seem to learn by observation without being trained to a particular task, but basically to you know, learn to understand the world. Right. So babies. Uh, around the age of two months, you know, learn uh, concepts like object permanence. The fact that, you know, I can I can hold an object, but if if I if I hide it behind me, you, you know, it's still there. Um, and you know, babies learn this really quickly. They learn uh, whether objects can can stay stable or or will fall, and they learn things like gravity uh, around nine months. So if you show a six month baby an object that seems to uh, float in the air, they're not surprised. But if you show that to a ten month baby, uh, the baby will look at it like uh, like the world is crumbling, um, a little bit like this little girl here. Um, and, and the reason is that in the meantime, around nine months, babies learn that objects that are not supported are supposed to fall. Now, nobody tells them that. Nobody gives them the name of anything. They just learn this by observation. And they possibly learn this by sort of training themselves to predict. Okay, So there is this hypothesis that's been around for a very long time, which is that what the brain essentially does is it trains itself to predict all the stuff that it cannot currently observe, and that it may be able to observe by waiting or by moving 
Um, so when I move a little bit, objects kind of move in different ways. And so the best way to explain how the, my view of the world changes when I move my head is that the world is three dimensional. I don't need to be, I don't need my brain to be hardwired to know that the brain is three dimensional. The, the world is three dimensional. If I move my head and I predict what the world is going to look like, I will have to infer the fact that the world is three dimensional. That's the best explanation for it. Um, so uh, my guess is that the the or my slogan, if you want, is that the next revolution in machine learning and AI will not be supervised. It will not be uh, reinforced uh, uh, either, uh, uh, in the sense that you know there is this uh, uh, mode of learning called reinforcement learning. Uh, it's in even more inefficient than uh, than supervised learning in many ways. But I'm, I'm not going to go into this very much. Um, so uh, deep learning works well for perception as long as you have data. D uh, deep reinforcement learning works well with for action generation, but you need way way too many interactions, which is why it basically only works for games where you can simulate the world. It doesn't really work in the real world. If you want to train a, uh, like a, a robot arm to do something, uh, you can do this to some extent by sort of transferring uh, simulation to, uh, to the real world. But it still takes the equivalent of tens of thousands of years of training in simulation for a system to learn to manipulate an object, for example. Um, so I think there's really three challenges that the sort of machine learning, AI, deep learning community should, should uh, strive to solve. The first one is learning with fewer label samples or fewer trials. And what I'm going to propose here is the idea of self-supervised learning. Uh, the, the second one is learning to reason. So essentially, uh, uh, you know, all the classical deep learning systems compute their output by just propagating through a bunch of layers. But a lot of what we do as humans and a lot of what some animals do is sort of more reflective, right? You, you kind of think about something before doing it. And that requires sort of you know, satisfying a set of constraints. And so this is a view of reasoning that basically turns down to or comes down to optimizing a function, right? The way you reason is by satisfying a set of constraints. You can you can measure the evaluation of those constraints as a set of uh, as an objective function, an energy function, if you want, and you sort of minimize that energy function uh, while you do inference. So reasoning might might be optimization the same way learning is uh, optimization. And then there's a third problem which I'm not going to say anything about because I have no idea how to solve it. Okay, so what is self-supervised learning? Self-supervised learning is the idea of filling the blanks. Uh, I was giving you the examples of uh, you know, babies kind of learning to predict what's going to happen in the world by observation. And this is really a the idea of self-supervised learning. Take a piece of video, show a piece of video to the system, and ask it to predict what's going to happen next. Or take a piece of, of uh, text, remove some of the words in the middle of the text, and ask the system to predict the words that are missing. Or, I don't know, remove the top of an image and ask, uh, ask the system to predict the, the missing part of the image. So that's the idea of self-supervised learning. Uh, pretend there is a part of the input you don't know and predict that. Uh, now, there are two kinds of it. Uh, uh, the one kind where you know in advance which part is going to be missing, and it's always going to be the same one, like, like video prediction. And another one where you never know which one it will be. That's slightly different. Um, so there's two, two uses, really, for self-supervised learning. The first one is learning hierarchical representations of the world. Uh, where you know, self-supervised learning basically is a pre-training that precedes a, a phase of supervised or reinforcement learning that will train the machine to actually do a task, whereas the pre-training just trains it to represent the world. Um, and the nice thing about this is that it doesn't require any label data, so you can use basically as much data as you want. It's essentially free. And then the second one is to learn predictive models of the world, which would be very useful for model predictive control and for, for control in, in general. Um, so the big technical question we have to solve here, and this is again a question to the applied math community, is how do we represent uncertainty and multimodality in the prediction? Uh, so here's the um, uh, here, here's here's the problem. The problem is um, uh, if you're looking at you're looking at me right now, uh, giving this talk, and the next thing I could do is move my head to the right or move my head to the left, right? So let's say you train a system with initial segments of video of me talking. And uh, you stop the video at some point, and you ask the system, "What's going to happen next?" The system may have no way of predicting whether I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, say this or or move my head to the right or to the left, which word I'm going to say, you know, how I'm going to move my uh, my lips, etc. So there is necessarily uh, a, a a necessity of representing uncertainty in the prediction. You cannot make a point prediction because uh, the best thing the system will do if you train a predictive system like this with least squares that it will produce an average of all the possible features that, that can happen, um, and so, which is not a good prediction. Right? It's going to be a blurry version of, uh, 
uh, overlapping versions of my face, right? So, uh, so how do you represent uncertainty? So, of course, if uh, if you're a machine learning uh, a person or a probabilist, uh, the first thing you say, or well, statistician, you say, well, you you know, don't learn a point, learn a distribution. And this works in certain cases. So, uh, but it doesn't work in continuous spaces because if you want to predict uh, uh, frames in a video, we basically have no way of representing good distributions on in the space of all video frames. Uh, this is a problem that we just not, don't know how we just don't know how to do it. And it, and all the things that people have tried basically don't work very well. So, um, so one way uh, to deal with this problem is to abandon the idea that we have to estimate uh, distributions and to basically focus on uh, uh, estimating level sets of a distribution or uh, representing the log of a distribution in an unnormalized manner by an energy function. So this is my favorite uh, uh, approach, uh, which I call energy-based models. And a lot of people have been you know, using this or proposing this in the past. So this is not necessarily my own invention, but I've been pushing this a lot. So an energy-based model is an energy function f of x, y, where x is an observed variable and y is a variable you want to predict. And it's, just, it's scalar value. And the, the scalar value that comes out of it is going to be low if x and y are compatible with each other. So if y is a good prediction for x, uh, say the good prediction for the future video where x is the initial segment. And, it's, and uh, the output value is going to be higher if, uh, if y is not a good continuation for, uh, for x, not a good completion of x, if you want. So the inference process in an energy-based model, uh, which is computing the output, consists in finding a y, which there may be multiple, that minimizes f of x y. Okay, that produces a low value for x, x, f of x y, and there might be several. And of course, there are several energy functions that will give you the same y's. Okay, uh, there are two examples here at the bottom, two different energy functions that give you the same uh, uh, result. Uh, you know, this is x, this is y here. Uh, so more generally, you will have a space. It would be a space of x and y, or just a space of y if your your system is uh, uh, unconditional, doesn't have an observation. And uh, your data points are, are those black dots. And what you need to learn when you train an energy-based model uh, is a, a, a function represented by those contours here that takes low value on the data and higher values outside. If this function is uh, continuous, differentiable, relatively smooth, you can use gradient descent to do inference, right? So I give you an x, and you can find by gradient descent the, the value of y that will minimize uh, your energy. So this is basically replacing a feedforward function of a neural net by an implicit function, really. Um, and in fact, you can recast a lot of classical learning algorithms in terms of sort of uh, energy-based models. So things like, let's say, k-means, for example. So this is uh, running k-means on a set of samples that are drawn from this little ellipse here in two dimension. And uh, what is being plotted here is the energy function, the energy surface after k means has been trained. So each of those black areas are basically energy wells uh, uh, centered around uh, prototypes. Uh, and, um, but, but the way to represent multimodality in an energy-based model is probably to do, it, to do something like, uh, like is shown here, where you take your x variable, you run it through a neural net or some parameterized function that produces a representation of the observation that are called h. Uh, and then you can run this through a decoder that makes a prediction, and you can measure the discrepancy, the error, the distance between the prediction you, you are given, the desired output you are given, and the prediction that the system produces y bar. Now, if uh, there are multiple y's that would be compatible with this x, you're only seeing one sample here. What you want is this to represent some sort of manifold it may not be a manifold. It could be a set of some kind of all the possible plausible uh, predictions. And the way to parameterize this manifold is through a latent variable. So you have a latent variable z here that goes also into the decoder. You can vary this latent variable over a set. And as you vary this latent variable over a set, your prediction varies over this manifold. Now, um, again, that's an energy-based model. And uh, what you can do is minimize with respect to z. So if I give you an x and a y, and I ask you, what's the energy of this pair of x, y, what you have to do is find the value of z that minimizes the, the prediction error. You immediately see a problem, which is that if z has too much capacity, let's imagine that z has the same dimension as y, then there's always going to be a z that for any y is going to produce essentially a zero reconstruction error. Imagine that z is the same dimension as y, and the decoder happens to learn the identity function, or some, something uh, similar to this. Then uh, for any y, there's going to be a z that's going to make the the reconstruction error, uh, the prediction error is zero. 
And so obviously that's not a good model. If, you, if your model you know, ignores the input data and gives you zero energy everywhere, you need a way to ensure that the energy is small or zero on the data points, but you need a way to ensure that it's higher outside the data points. And you have two options for doing this. One is called contrastive methods, and the other one is called architectural methods. So the architectural methods um, consist in essentially limiting the information capacity of Z by either uh, minimizing its dimension or the rank of the, the, the values, values of Z over the training set, or by making it sparse, or, or, or by making it noisy. I mean, there's various ways to do this, but that's essentially what it comes down to. You have to limit the capacity, information capacity of Z somehow. Um, now, inference, when you have a latent variable model like, like this with Z, it can be done in two ways. The one I explained is minimizing with respect to Z to uh, eliminate it. Uh, so this is this. Another way, if you're a probabilist, is marginalize over Z. And that uh, comes down to basically computing what physicists call a free energy, uh, which is this uh, little formula here, uh, where beta is some arbitrary uh, positive parameter. And uh, this uh, formula here, which is basically an, an, uh, sort of integration over possible values of Z, uh, uh, reduces to the to the one at the top here when beta goes to infinity, which is the zero temperature limit in, in physics. Um, so uh, latent variable models, uh, and this is a small illustration of a latent variable model where imagine that your data manifold is an ellipse, and then the latent variable would be the angle of uh, a point on the ellipse. And then when I give you a data point y, the energy of that point is the distance to the closest point on the ellipse. So I have to minimize that distance with respect to the latent variable, which is the angle, uh, to find the energy. Right. Very simple. But of course, in reality, we don't have this manifold. We have to learn it. OK, so how do we train an energy-based model? Bas you know, two methods, as I said, contrastive methods. And contrastive methods consist in taking a data point, pushing down on it, and then taking a point outside and pushing up on it, or taking a bunch of points outside the data manifold and pushing up on them. Um, and that actually works quite well in the context of image and speech recognition at the moment. But it's extremely expensive computationally because in high dimensional spaces you have to push up on lots and lots and lots of different places. Um, so, but that's you know a, a somewhat successful category of method that's uh, uh, very popular at the moment in computer vision and speech recognition. And then there are this other class which I think in the long run will probably win out, but at the moment they're not actually working very well. Uh, the, those regularized architectural methods that consist in explicitly regularizing the capacity of the latent variable so that you limit the information capacity of it. Um, so this is a bit of an eye chart, but it basically lists a lot of classical machine learning algorithms uh, as to whether they are contrastive or uh, regularized or architectural. So things like uh, metric learning Siamese networks, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, are contrastive methods. Adversarial uh, methods like GANs are, 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 are this type as well. Uh, Denoising autoencoders and mass autoencoders that are incredibly successful in the context of natural language processing uh, are also contrastive. So those really work really well. Those don't work nearly as well, but in my opinion, in the long run, they're more they're more uh, uh, promising. And this connects with a lot of things that artifacts that the applied math community has been obsessed with for a very long time. Think like sparse coding, uh, sp uh, and sparse modeling, uh, you know, ISTA and various, th various things like that. And then things that are more, more uh, kind of modern in the deep learning community, like variational autoencoders, sparse autoencoders, uh, VQVAE, and things like this. I'm gonna I'm not gonna talk about the rest. Um, let me skip this. Uh, so uh, in contrastive methods, there's various ways to define objective functions. And basically, the, the basic design principle for a good objective function is, uh, is that your objective function will have a term that's going to push down on the energy of a data point, x, y. And it's going to have another term that's going to push up on the energy of some other point that somehow has been generated to be outside the manifold of data. Um, so this is an example of a margin loss. Um, but there is like a whole bunch of those losses that people have used in, in various contexts, uh, mostly not in the context of uh, self-supervised learning, mostly in supervised learning. But, uh, uh, but you have a kind of wide uh, array of, of possible objective functions. If you insist on estimating densities uh, with, your, with your system, so if you, if you insist that your energy function be the uh, logarithm of some uh, distribution, then the only objective function you can use is the negative log likelihood of the data under your model, which is basically a particular type of objective function that has a term that pushes down on the energy of data points, and then a horrible intractable integral that attempts to push up on the energy of every point, including the data points, but with a smaller force. And so probabilistic approaches basically force you to use a particular type of loss function that happens to have a completely intractable term in it. 
uh, which is why I'm a big advocate of those energy-based models. It gives you more flexibility in the objective function, and uh, you might be able to eschew the issues due to those uh, normalization. Now, something that's really popular at the moment is uh, those so-called uh, contrastive methods, which are really sort of uh, an application of what's called uh, Siamese networks. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details of what the objective function is, but, uh, and I don't seem to, have, and here is the slide. Um, so people call this contrastive embedding. And the, the way you, you do this is that you, you take a sample, you distort the sample in some way that does not change its nature. And those are your, this is your pair X and Y. You run those two images through uh, two uh, identical neural nets. They both produce an H, a representation. Okay, and then you compare those two representations. So those are vectors. You just compare them with some distance, say Euclidean distance, or, or cosine similarity, so that you normalize the norms. Um, and what you do is that when the pair of images are symmetrically uh, identical, then you force those two vectors to be as close to each other as possible. That's one term in your, in your cost. And then you have a contrastive term that where you pick a random sample from your data set, or maybe not a random sample, but a sample that you know is different. And you feed those two images, and then you force those, those two vectors to basically move, move away from each other. You can use one of those uh, losses I was talking about earlier. People use currently what's called this uh, NCE, uh, noise contrastive estimation, uh, you know, which is a normalized exponential of, uh, of, those, of those similarities. This works really well. So the idea goes back uh, a long time, a paper of mine from 93, where we used this for uh, a signature verification. And this sort of, uh, more recent work I did with my students in the mid 2000s that was largely ignored. And more recently, those methods have become extremely successful for learning features in images. In fact, there is a, uh, a more recent paper from DeepMind here that use, uses a somewhat similar idea, although uh, a little different, which works even better. Uh, and there's a whole crop of papers that are being prepared that uh, are popping up on archives that use those methods nowadays. Uh, let me back up a little bit. Um, so one thing that's been incredibly successful is contrastive methods uh, in the in the, uh, the form of denoising autoencoder. So what is a denoising autoencoder? You take uh, a piece of data Y, let's say a piece of text or an image, let's say a piece of text, you corrupt it in some way. So you remove some of the information or you corrupt it. In the case of a text, you would remove some of the words and replace them by a blank marker. And then you run this through some big neural net and train this neural net. In the case of uh, NLP, it's, uh, this neural net is usually what's called a transformer. Uh, which is a particular type of architecture. And then you minimize the reconstruction error. So you basically train the system to predict the, the clean version of the input only using the corrupted version where some of the uh, uh, input has been masked. Okay, so basically training the system to predict the words that are missing in your text. In the process of doing so, the system runs a representation of text that actually contains all the semantic and, and syntactic information about, about text. So uh, if it is a sentence like uh, uh, the blank in the house chases the mouse, it will easily infer that the missing word is cat because it's seen you know, similar, uh, similar examples before. And what it produces is a prob probability distribution for every missing word. Uh, and that probability distribution is over all the possible words in the dictionary. So self-supervised learning in the context of text works amazingly well. I mean, this method of pre-training it uh, uh, a, a natural language understanding system uh, is, is, has now become universal. The, the basic idea of it, uh, the, I mean, the basic form of this, the, the special form of this has come up about two and a half years ago and it completely revolutionized the way people do NLP. Uh, and now it's used absolutely everywhere. Uh, and those networks are gigantic. There are you know, hundreds of, of, of billions of parameters sometimes, at least billions of parameters. So uh, incredibly successful uh, uh, use of uh, self-supervised learning there. You know, you can, you can have dialogue systems now that almost sound human. Uh, some uh, uh, researchers at Facebook Air Research in Paris, Guillaume Lamp and Francois Charton, have actually trained one of those systems to, as, as if it were language translation, to actually solve differential equations. So uh, symbolically, this is not numerically, this is symbolically, right? So you give an equation like this, it's represented as a string, which is turned into kind of a tree representation in Polish notation to the input of the system. So it's, it sees this really as a text. And then you train it by generating example uh, backwards. You train it to uh, just integrate this, uh, this uh, uh, differential equations uh, uh, very simply. And it works for uh, computing integrals symbolically, solving differential equations, uh, uh, first order and second order. Um, it works better than whatever you know, MATLAB, Maple, and Mathematica uh, gives you in many cases, which is sort of 
uh, amazing. They have a similar system now that is trying to translate a program from one language to another, you know, substituting the appropriate idioms and, and function calls and everything. Uh, it's, it's, it's frankly completely amazing that it works at all, but it does. Um, Okay, let me skip this in the interest of time. Um, so connecting this with uh, things that people know in applied math is uh, this idea of uh, 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 sparse coding. Okay, so uh, uh, here this is uh, sparse coding, sparse modeling, uh, formulated in terms of those energy-based models. So you have a latent variable, it's regularized by some sort of you know, L1 norm in the case of sparse coding. The decoder is a linear function just multiplying by a matrix. You have a reconstruction, and the reconstruction error is just a quadratic uh, uh, distance. And uh, the inference process, of course, consists in finding the value of z that minimizes the reconstruction error. Um, and that's basically uh, sparse coding. Sparse modeling consists in learning this uh, uh, matrix by, by gradient descent under some constraints on the norm. Now, uh, there is something uh, interesting about this, a twist that has appeared over the last 10 years or so, which is sparse autoencoders. And what people have now come to call um, um, amortized inference. So instead of doing the inference of this variable, by doing uh, the ISTA algorithm that optimizes this function every time you have a new Y, what you do is that you train a neural net to, make, to predict what the solution of that optimization problem is going to be. So instead of solving an optimization problem, you train a neural net to solve that optimization problem, and you hope that this neural net will give you kind of a good approximate solution, which you might refine or not um, uh, at the end. And this form of uh, uh, auto, what's called regularized autoencoder uh, is very powerful. So you can think of this latent variable as being optimized or marginalized over, and you can think of this guy as kind of predicting the optimal value of the latent variable. Uh, there's a form of this called variational autoencoder, which I'm not going to go into, uh, where basically the z's are not points, but they are like little uh, Gaussian fuzzy balls. So you know, sparse coding works. You you train uh, sparse coding on MNIST, and you get you know columns of the decoding matrix that look like parts of uh, characters, and uh, you should train on natural image patches. You know, it learns really quickly that. Uh, image patches can be approximated by a weighted sum of a small number of edges, oriented edges. Um, and, and, and you can actually push the analogy even further. So this is uh, a system that I call LISTA, Learning Interactive Shrinkage and Thresholding Algorithm, which, consi which consists in basically viewing the ISTA algorithm as, which is the optimization algorithm to solve this L1, L2 problem, as a recurrent neural net. And you're going to train the matrices in that recurrent neural net to give you a, a good approximation to the optimization problem as fast as possible. And you know it's, it's amazing, but it works. And it seems like a free lunch. Like, why would a trained system give you a better, uh, faster approximate solution than actually running the optimization algorithm in the first place? And the reason is that this system is only trained to solve the problem for certain types of inputs. It's trained, for example, with image patches or with audio signals. It's not trained to solve the problem for any random signal, which, of course, the, the full algorithm can do. Um, OK, so let me uh, skip ahead. Um, so there's sort of various ways of uh, uh, you know, training the systems, but I want to I come to uh, one particular one, um, uh, which is uh, using those kind of latent variable models to do video prediction uh, and to do so in ways that can help, for example, self-driving systems. So let's say you have a bird's eye view of your car surrounded by other cars. The green cars are other cars around you. You are the blue car. And you observe what the cars around you have been doing so far. And what you'd like to do is being able to predict what cars around you are going to do. So you can plan uh, a good trajectory ahead and avoid, uh, uh, avoid accidents. So you can you know, train one of those energy-based models uh, to kind of make the prediction. And the prediction will be multimodal. So these are examples. I hope you can see the video. If you don't have a latent variable, you just make a point prediction. You get the blurry prediction that you see on the second column. Uh, but if you do use a latent variable, uh, and you change the way you sample the latent variable, you get four different types of predictions here that are shown on the, the four columns uh, on the left. The one on the, oh, on the right, I'm sorry. Uh, on the left is just a recorded uh, uh, you know, training sample that actually occurs. So you can have multimodality with this, uh, these latent variable models. And this is very important if you want to do model predictive control, which I'm sure many of you are, are, are familiar with. So you have a forward model of the world that predicts where the next state of the world is going to be as the uh, function of the previous state, the action you're taking, and perhaps some latent variable that you have to draw at random. Okay, And if you can unroll this uh, model in time, uh, and you can measure a, an objective function, c of s, at every time step, you could imagine, by gradient descent, optimizing a sequence of actions that will minimize your cost. Right? This is classical model predictive control. 
And of course, all of those is differentiable. Your model has been trained in advance, so you can just do this uh, you know, by automatic differentiation using the same tools that we use to train neural nets. Um, now, another thing you can do with a small fish is that instead of inferring a sequence of action, you use the gradient of the cost on, over the sequence uh, uh, you know, with respect to the action to train a, a policy, what's called a policy network. So it's a network that takes the state at the previous time step and tries to predict the action. So again, it's a, one of those types of amortized uh, inference that I was telling you about earlier. And uh, if you train the system to drive itself in the context of what I showed, uh, it actually works quite well. Uh, this is a trick you have to use to kind of prevent the system from going into parts of the space that are where the predictions are unreliable. But uh, it works pretty well. So this is an example of uh, the blue car driving itself. The little white dot indicates whether it accelerates, uh, whether it brakes, or whether it turns. And you have to realize that here, the green uh, the green cars are recorded. The blue car is invisible to them because it's a new car that we just put in, in this recorded video. And so uh, it has to basically learn to avoid the other cars, avoid getting squeezed. Um, and you know, it works OK. Um, right, so conclusions, conjectures, and open questions. Self-supervised learning uh, is learning dependencies. Reasoning is uh, minimizing energies, uh, basically inferring latent variables. You could think of it this way. I didn't talk much about this, but this is what it comes down to. Uh, the main obstacles we have to face, it's hard to properly represent uncertainty. And uh, my uh, recommendation here is to abandon the idea that we need to learn distributions. And uh, learning energies is simpler uh, uh, mathematically and, and in theory. So I'm proposing to use energy-based models. And uh, you know there are contrastive methods and regularized latent variable methods. And my money at the moment is on regularized latent variable energy-based models, even though the contrastive form is actually, as of today, much more uh, efficient. Um, now, beyond this, uh, could energy-based self-supervised learning be the basis for machines to acquire common sense, basically by learning how the world works uh, by, by watching video and, uh, and, and you know, not interacting much, like, like maybe uh, humans and animals? Um, I think it's an interesting question. Uh, I, I hope the answer to that question is yes, but I really don't know. Um, and uh, just as a side note, uh, a lot of people are talking about artificial general intelligence and are kind of hoping that by scaling either supervised or reinforcement learning methods that we currently have uh, with bigger hardware uh, and, and more data, we'll reach something like human level intelligence. I think this, this is completely hopeless. I think to reach anywhere close to even cat level intelligence, we, we'll need to go through this type of, uh, of learning. Um, we are going to get there just with reinforcement learning or supervised learning. Uh, there's been a lot of discussions also about deep learning, whether it's an engineering science or a natural science, whether it's uh, uh, you know, actually a science or uh, more like alchemy. And the interesting thing about deep learning is that it's, it's an engineering artifact that we need to study and that we don't completely understand. Uh, and it's not because we don't understand it that we should not use it, right? Uh, because in the history of technology and science, a lot of artifacts like the telescope, the steam engine, electromagnets, you know, the airplane, et cetera, have appeared before people actually had the theory to explain how they work, right? The theory was actually developed as a consequence of those artifacts uh, uh, being developed and being useful. And so it motivated theory theorists to kind of really understand what uh, what this was. Um, so, um, um, you know, I think, uh, uh, I think that's really the, the, the history. Of, so we're in a kind of similar situation here where we have an artifact, you know, deep learning systems, but we don't really have sort of a general theory that explain why they why they work. So we are like you know people who built uh, steam engines uh, in the early nineteenth uh, century or late eighteenth century. You know they had to wait for you know roughly hundred years for thermodynamics to really explain uh, uh, you know the limits of it and and, and why it works. So uh, you know the the goal of my career is basically to figure out what is the equivalent of uh, thermodynamics for machine intelligence or for intelligence in general. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for a fascinating lecture. Um, and so now we come to the question and answer session, and there are a lot of questions which came in. Um, so one question is, for instance, by Bernhard Gott, my heart. He asks, uh, currently the weakness of reinforcement learning are strategic decisions because they, they lead to delayed rewards. Can you give some input about how to solve this problem? Right, so okay, there is three problems in reinforcement learning. Uh, the first problem is your objective 
is not known. It's not, it's not a module in your program. It's not a differentiable function whose derivative you know. It's, uh, it's something you can only measure by taking an action in the world and then observing the result from the world. So the world is going to give you uh, a scalar value, basically, that tells you the action you took was good or bad. And it's not going to give you that value every time. It's going to give, give it to you once in a while. OK, so, so basically, it comes down to trial and errors. The second problem is that the action you take will determine the sample you see next. OK, um, and so you, know, you learn to uh, ride a bike. And you know, if you do something, you're, you're going to fall. That, that will determine what, uh, what sample you, you learn from next. And so you cannot make the usual hypothesis in uh, machine learning theory, which is independence of samples. Right? You don't have independent samples. So those are the two main problems. Uh, and the third main problem I already sort of alluded to, which is the fact that the environments only gives you back a single scalar. And so because it gives you a single scalar, uh, it's, it's horribly inefficient. Uh, you need to, many, many, many trials to learn anything, unless you already have a good representation of the world. So one might ask, what is it that allows humans to learn to drive a car in about 20 hours of training without causing any accident, mostly? Whereas if you were to train a, uh, you know, some of the best uh, reinforcement learning systems uh, at the moment, at least the pure ones that are model free, um, it would take you know, millions of hours of training, which of course you could only do in simulations. Uh, and, and the car would destroy itself you know, hundreds of thousands of times, if not million. So the difference is that humans have this predictive model of the world in their head, and they also have a good idea of the objective function. And because this objective function is computed by their brain, it's differentiable. I mean, they, they, get, they, they know it, right? So you could imagine some way of estimating gradients that don't uh, imply uh, interacting in the world. And that's pretty much what I saw, what I showed uh, in my little example of a self-driving car, it's not reinforcement learning there. Nothing is reinforcement learning because everything is differentiable, everything is, is known, and the, the system has a complete model of the world, which is itself differentiable, uh, which it learned through uh, observations, through self-supervised learning. So what allows us to learn to drive a car uh, quickly is that we know that you know, if you drive next to a cliff next to us, if we, if we turn the wheel to the right, the car is going to run off the cliff, and nothing good is going to come out of it, right? Our model of the, of the physics and our model of the objective function, which is that we shouldn't fall down the cliff, uh, is such that we don't need to try. We know that uh, the result is going to be bad, right? So this idea of learning predictive models, crucially, is what, what was going to bring the sort of a new, uh, the, the next revolution in reinforcement learning as well. Now, the problem is that it's the same problem that we had with neural nets uh, way back, which is that from the theoretical point of view, it's very hard to prove that model-based reinforcement learning works better than model-free reinforcement learning. In fact, you can prove the opposite. So in theory, model-based is worse than model-free. Uh, but in practice, it learns way, way faster if you do it right. Um, so you know, the proper way to do this is not clear. But it's the future, there's no question. Okay. Thank you. So another question is about energy-based models. Um, and the question is, uh, energy-based models uh, look like free energy minimization from chemistry and material science to simulate materials properties. I mean, um, are these um, ideas from both fields, do they um, use ideas from the other field? Um, so can you comment on that, that connection? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I use the same, symbol, the same symbols as in statistical physics, basically, right? So, uh, you know, the minus one over beta log integral e to the minus beta, the energy, that's a free energy. I mean, you know, up to the minus one over beta. But um, this is like the, you know, there's the very famous uh, equation in thermodynamics, uh, which is the free energy is equal to the average energy minus the, the temperature times the entropy. And the, this term that I talk about here is the minus temperature times the entropy. So um, uh, I mean, basically, it's the free energy, but, you know, divided by the temperature, uh, multiplied by the temperature. Uh, so, uh, I mean, clearly, the, the math is the same. Um, you know, people call, you know, talk about variational inference, which is completely borrowed from uh, from, from statistical physics. When they don't use variational inference, they use uh, Monte Carlo and Mokoche Monte Carlo uh, inference, which is also derived from physics. Um, so yes, the, the, math, the math is the same. The, the concepts are the same. Uh, some people in machine learning actually get annoyed by, by me because, uh, because I, I stick to the notation of physics. And people in uh, machine learning you know, like to talk about like, you know, objectives that you maximize rather than minimize. So and and they always you know prefer to write distributions instead of energy so um, so they get annoyed by me because of that but yes it's the same math. Mm -hmm. 
So another question is by Gantavi Bhatt. Um, he asks, in many works, people tend to apply contrastive loss in the latent uh, spaces. Can you comment on when the model trained with loss applied in the original space uh, will surpass the contrastive loss applied in the latent space, or in general, what are the weaknesses of contrasted, contrastive learning paradigm? Right. So I don't know if I uh, can go back to the, the slide. I'll, I'll try, but it may take a little while. Um, yeah, so I mean, the, the contrastive, the, the Siamese network, uh, the sort of standard form of contrastive uh, learning that, that people use at the moment actually does contrastive learning in the representation. Um, but um, there's a slide that I skipped that I want to go to, if I can, which is another example. So this is another way of learning, uh, training a, a latent variable energy based model uh, to do prediction, uh, which does not require uh, contrastive terms. And so this is a, a thing where you, you try to extract a representation of a friend. So let's say those are video frames, right? So you, you look at yt minus 1 yt, and you're trying to predict the next frame, uh, yt plus 1. Uh, and one thing you could do is uh, uh, basically train an autoencoder to encode this frame, yt of 1, and use the same autoencoder to encode the next frame. So what you get are two codes, h, uh, for the two frames. And then have an internal model that you train simultaneously that uh, uh, attempts to predict where the next h is going to be for the, the next frame. Uh, and then you decode and, and minimize the reconstruction error, I mean the prediction error for the for the next frame. So ignore the, the bottom part of this at the moment. Okay, so this is sort of a, a predictive model. It doesn't require any contrastive learning or anything. Um, and the reason it doesn't require any contrastive learning is because you force the h representation here to contain all the information about the input because you force it to reconstruct the input. And so you know that no information is going to get lost in the encoding of a, uh, y into h because you force the reconstruction. That's an alternative to the contrastive term that tries to make sure that uh, uh, you know, representations are different for different inputs. Here, they must be different because uh, the system must be able to reconstruct the input. So you have those representations. Uh, and then you train a, a third network, a kind of a, a predictor network, if you want, to predict the, next, the representation of the next frame. OK, but it's quite possible that there are a lot of things in the prediction that are not predictable, that you know, the information, information is insufficient uh, in the past to predict the future. As I said, you know, the world is not entirely predictable. There's some stochasticity to it. And so what you could do is add a latent variable uh, to this uh, uh, h that basically takes into account the, all the stuff that you cannot predict that may happen in the, in the model. Uh, the diagram here is not completely accurate for this situation. Uh, I guess the situation is more akin to the one I showed for the, 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 the driving system. And you can think of this encoder here as, as uh, again, uh, implementing this amortized inference idea of you know, predicting the optimal value of the latent variable uh, without having to do kind of uh, inference. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm a big fan of this idea of eventually, uh, uh, you know, essentially kind of forcing the system to do prediction in latent space. But, uh, but I'm, I'm trying to eliminate the, the contrastive phase because it's too expensive computationally. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, for the sake of time, I would now hand over again to uh, Carola. Thank you so much, Jan, for a really fascinating talk. I very much enjoyed it. And we had uh, 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 an amazing uh, turnout uh, in terms of participants, just to emphasize this. I think at some point we had more than 500 uh, just here, oh, and wow. I'm sure there are many more. On well, YouTube. thanks, everyone, for showing up. That's, that's, that's wonderful to hear. Um, so I'll just conclude this uh, session by reminding everyone of our next and final plenary talk that will be given by Yuri Nesterov on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, same time, on inexact accelerated high order proximal point methods. So until then, see you soon. Thank you.